Hello everyone, it's Dr. Ryan here coming to you again from my office and in this video I'm going to go through another step one question that was sent to me by one of my Twitter followers. So let's get started. So here's the question. A newborn baby is examined shortly after birth. He was born at full term to a mother who received no prenatal care. He has slanted palpebral fissures, prominent epicanthal folds, and a single palmar crease. There's a large reducible midline abdominal protrusion covered by skin. The umbilical stump is located near the center of the protrusion. What is the most likely cause of this boy's abdominal finding? And the answer choices are failure of the extraembryonic gut to return to the abdominal cavity, incomplete closure of the abdominal ring, incomplete recanalization of the fetal intestinal tract, incomplete rotation of the midgut in utero, or persistent processes vaginalis. So the first thing you need to recognize in order to answer this question is that they're describing a baby who has Down syndrome. Slanted palpebral fissures, prominent epicanthal folds, and a single palmar crease are all classic findings in children who have Down syndrome. And at some point before you take the step one exam, you wanna make sure you know what every one of these terms means. It's very likely they're not gonna simply tell you that a baby or a child has Down syndrome. Instead, they're gonna describe the physical findings. So before your step exam, you wanna know what the palpebral fissures are and what slanted palpebral fissures look like. You wanna know what the epicanthal folds are and what prominent epicanthal folds look like in a baby with Down syndrome. And you wanna know all about the single palmar crease. Search up all of these findings on Google, look at pictures of them and make sure you understand what they mean. Okay, so once you recognize that this question is describing a baby with Down syndrome, the next step is to figure out what the large reducible midline abdominal protrusion covered by skin represents. And if you don't know, this is a classic description of an umbilical hernia. And babies born with Down syndrome have a higher incidence of umbilical hernias compared to the general population. So if you know that, then you can look for the answer choices and see which one describes the formation of an umbilical hernia. And this is it, answer choice B, incomplete closure of the abdominal ring. This is what leads to an umbilical hernia. Okay, so let's look at the wrong answers now and talk about why they're wrong. So choice A is failure of the extra embryonic gut to return to the abdominal cavity. So this is describing an omphalocele. In an omphalocele, abdominal contents like the intestines are outside the baby's body when the baby is born. But the key thing to know here is that in an omphalocele, the intestines are covered by a membrane. They are not covered by skin. When the defect is completely covered by skin, that's a hernia, not an omphalocele. You also could maybe think that choice A is describing gastroschisis, which is another abdominal wall defect where intestines and other organs are found outside the baby's body. But gastroschisis is a paraumbilical defect. So the defect is to the side of the umbilical stump. And here they're telling you the umbilical stump is located near the center of the protrusion. They're telling you this is an umbilical defect, not a paraumbilical defect like gastroschisis. Incomplete recanalization of the fetal intestinal tract is describing duodenal atresia or stenosis. This leads to a bowel obstruction, not bowel contents protruding from the abdominal wall. Same is true for incomplete rotation of the midgut and utero. This is describing midgut malrotation, which also leads to a bowel obstruction. And then finally, a persistent processus vaginalis leads to an inguinal hernia, but not to an umbilical hernia. So there's a lot of good stuff in these answers, a lot of details about abdominal and intestinal defects in babies. And if you get this question wrong, like I said, that is a fantastic thing because now going forward, you're always gonna remember that babies who have Down syndrome have a higher incidence of umbilical hernias, and that's something that may come up on your board exams. And I'll just show you that the information you need to answer this question is found in first aid. This is the page in first aid describing Down syndrome. And you can see right here, it says increased risk of umbilical hernia caused by incomplete closure of the umbilical ring. So there's a lot of great information in first aid, but there's so much of it, it can sometimes be overwhelming. So you wanna make sure you zoom in on every little thing first aid says and that you know what it means. But once again, this is why questions and practice are so important because even if you had just read this page on first aid, you might not have remembered this fact right here. But once you do that question and you get it wrong, you're always gonna remember it going forward. And then here's the page in first aid for the boards that describes ventral wall defects. It talks about gastroschisis and omphaloceles. It mentions how gastroschisis is a paraumbilical herniation, not an umbilical herniation like we saw in the question. It also talks about how omphaloceles are covered by membranes like the peritoneum and the amnion, 
but they're not covered by skin. And then down here at the bottom is a picture of a congenital umbilical hernia, and it mentions that it may be associated with disorders like Down syndrome. So everything you need to answer this question is found in first aid for the boards. You just have to know where to look for it, and you need to remember it, and remembering it is the hard part, and that's why you have to do practice questions. And so the takeaway from this question is that getting questions wrong can be a great thing. If you get this question wrong, it will stick some very important information in your head so that you will always remember that babies with Down syndrome may have umbilical hernias, and you'll also remember what causes umbilical hernias. A second takeaway is that it's important to go over all the wrong answers because as you saw in the wrong answers here, there's actually a review of a number of other types of hernias and congenital intestinal defects. Those are all found there in the answer choices. So if you review all those carefully and recognize why they don't fit with this case, then you'll walk away from this question with a lot of knowledge that will help you on step one. And that concludes today's video on a step one question review.